first uh, issue has to do with a uh, comment I made the other day, really, uh, which was related to Google, uh, Apple, and um, Facebook. Uh, some of these companies are being regulated. Regulated, you know, they want to break them up maybe because they're too big, like they did with the baby bells. That's one option. Another option is to tax them at a higher rate, especially in this, these days of COVID where they've taken such uh, draconian uh, measures, the politicians, uh, to keep people inside the houses. Uh, a lot of people are out of work. And so they got to get their taxes from somewhere. And they're, I guess they're going to tax the big corporations. And there was a, a lawsuit or or an action by the European government, uh, French government specifically in this case, against one of these big corporations. And here you see it. France finds Google 500 million euros in new copyright row. Actually, it was closer to 600 million euros, which is like 700 million dollars okay so a big fine against google i'm not sure if they're going to appeal it i'm not sure if they can um, and it says long-running battle has centered on claims that google has been showing articles pictures and videos produced by media outlets when displaying search results without adequate compensation despite the seismic shift of global advertising revenues towards the search giant okay so that's uh the main gripe against Google. And faced with dwindling print subscriptions, media outlets argue that Google should be giving them a bigger cut of advertising revenues from search results that display their content. Okay, And Google's argument was that um, some of these uh, companies, they get uh, their revenue by traffic being diverted to them. And these companies uh, say that's not enough. You should also give us a piece of the advertising revenue. That's what this case was about. And friends, competition watchdog, <laughs> competition watchdog, what the hell is that? On Tuesday, slapped Google with 500 million euros, 593 million oh, dollars. Okay, maybe I was wrong, uh, 600 million dollars. Fine for failing to negotiate in good faith with media companies over the use of their content under EU copyrights uh, rules. The biggest ever fine imposed by what? The competition authority. See, it used to be the antitrust, now well, they call it the <laughs> competition authority. Anyways, they're going after some of these big com companies. And the question is whether, uh, first, it, whether it's a good idea, that's one question, you know, because you would think that, assuming that if Google becomes richer, it becomes bigger, it hires more people, you know, and you would think it puts people to work. That's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is that maybe they're already too big, maybe you got to break them up. Okay, like the baby bells. Another one is that maybe you should tax them at a higher rate because they're making, uh, you know, um, terrible uh, <laughs> uh, profits. Okay, maybe we should spread the uh, the good uh, uh, the bonanza around, you know, among the people somehow through government. So there's all different philosophies and political uh, ways of addressing the issue. And the question is, which one will they follow? Okay. But apparently they, uh, not only them, but uh, I was reading that Australia and some other company, countries are also trying to target these big corporations and uh, they're either going after their taxes or regulating them or maybe even suggesting that they should be broken up. Again, we don't know what's going to happen there. Okay, uh, more closer to extinction. Uh, we had uh, some questions on the Neanderthals, okay? Again, a subject I absolutely love, okay? And this fellow says... Out of Africa, hypothesis is really fragile. An idiot, in my opinion. Uh -huh. And new evidence, Neanderthal skeleton, was recently found in the Middle East, and it is older than European ones. Okay, uh, Middle East, I guess, uh, could be Israel, maybe Syria, maybe Iraq. They found some caves there, and they found, allegedly, allegedly, Neanderthal uh, skulls or bones or fossils, okay? And based on those finds, they, they you know, uh, reach conclusions, okay? This fellow read something, I don't know where, uh, he didn't give any reference, uh, but he says that uh, Neanderthals that were found somewhere in the Middle East are older than European ones. I don't know, I have great doubts. Okay, here's the uh, oldest one we have, the oldest skull we have of a Neanderthal, and that's the, uh, can you get it up here? Ah, go on the other side, give me a second here. And uh, this is the oldest skull. It's from Italy, Sacco Pastore, uh, number one. And that's um, 130 to 100,000 years ago. And again, uh, wide ranges because the farther back in time, the harder it is to date. Usually uh, they date it with things that are around there. You can't uh, carbon date these because carbon dating doesn't go beyond 50,000 years. 
So you look at other clues and you reach an approximate date. That's why the way or date is the range is so wide. Okay, that's Laco Pastor. That's supposedly the oldest Neanderthal skull we have today. Okay, and that's in Italy. And I don't think you'll find one <laughs> in uh, in the Middle East. Uh, and here's uh, an even older one. And this is not a Neanderthal. It's his forefather. Uh, this is Heidelbergensis, the Swanscombe skull, uh, approximately 400,000 years ago. Again, very wide ranges here, okay? maybe 400,000 years ago. And that came out of England. And it's not really a, it's not really a man. It's a woman, first of all, a female. And it's not a Neanderthal. It's uh, their parents, uh, Heidelbergensis, Homo Heidelbergensis. And uh, so what this shows, okay, together with some other uh, evidence that's out there, is that there were two-legged creatures like monkeys like gorillas like humans uh, something like that uh in england okay and uh so if they were th uh, there already at that time and the theory is that neanderthals descended from them then neanderthals were born in europe you know by the time um maybe homo erectus maybe heidelberg one of those uh was out then came neanderthal which descended from that group that originally was in western europe so, um, you know, if you follow that line and you cannot think that uh, what this uh, individual is suggesting, which is that maybe, perhaps, um, uh, the Neanderthals came from the Middle East, okay? So I don't know about what this fellow is saying there. I don't uh, accept that hypothesis. I don't, I don't use that as an assumption. I say that the ones that we, the skeletons, the fossils, the bones that we find in the Middle East are not at all Neanderthals. Or some other species okay and uh to, i'm just gonna one more time show you this okay and this is these uh this is a paper uh written um by experts who look at these bones and they give you their five cents worth again their opinion but you know they say that the bones that they find in israel especially and and also uh, the ones in uh, iraq they found uh, a cave there as well full of bones and they say that there is little, actually little evidence for the existence of a Southwest Asiatic Neanderthal population in Israel during the Middle Paleolithic period. Human fossils originally labeled as Neanderthals were subsequently reevaluated and defined otherwise. A horizontal mandibular foramen, they go out there and they say, uh, has, uh, uh, which character is, it arises 61% of the Neanderthals is absent. And they mention three of the sites there, Shandadar being uh, one in Iraq. Okay, so, you know, the uh, Neanderthals, the alleged Neanderthals that you find in uh, the Middle East and the Levant, uh, they don't, they don't uh, match exactly. There are significant differences, in other words, with the so-called, with a Neanderthal, the original, the uh, classical Neanderthals of Western Europe, of Spain, France, Belgium, and Germany, and possibly uh, England, if they ever find one. There, okay, they haven't found really a bone there, but don't put it past them someday, they might. Okay, anyways, uh, these folks seem to uh, say that what you see in the Levant are not uh, Neanderthals. And the reason I like that uh, proposal, that assumption, that theory, if you want, um, is that I cannot imagine Neanderthal, who I make the assumption that they were born in Europe from uh, first from um, going farther back, right, from Homer Erectus and then from. Um, Heidelbergensis, man of Heidelberg. I think that's the line that gave origin to Neanderthals. Once the Neanderthals were born, they were born in the cold, they were born in the Arctic, they were used to that weather, they were polar bears, they were like the uh, woolly mammoths, of, uh, human, ma uh, human woolies, a woolly man. And so, you know, not only they did not need clothes, but this was their natural habitat. And so they, they had no problem. They walked in the snow, they, they could even sleep in the snow. They were built for the snow and and, and such an animal such a creature uh, you know uh, i don't think would go to the middle east farther south where the warm weather was uh, uh, raging closer to the equator it's like you're asking a polar bear to go to the equator does that happen uh, i don't think so okay and i don't think Neanderthal had any reason to go farther south because he had a lot of game and uh, as far as i'm concerned you know humans came out of africa they went through the Middle East and they went north. And the reason is why? Well, I think they were either following the herds or they were looking for food and they found more food up north than in the south. 
and they ventured into Europe. And when the Neanderthals were gone, you know, they uh, settled in Europe and they lasted, you know, to, to today. And the reason for that is there was enough game in the north. There was not enough game in the south. Apparently, that's why the migration was northward. There was no reason for climatic reasons and for food reasons for the Neanderthals to go south to the Levant. And so, you know, um, this is uh, my little map on that. Okay, I'm saying that, you know, there's no chance that the Neanderthals, which were probably like gorillas, somewhat like them. In other words, they were woolly, the woolly man. I don't think they would go south uh, to, you know, Mount Camels. In the, in the Middle East. No, I think they stayed up north where they hunted uh, woolly mammoths and uh, uh, the uh, European buffalo and so on. Uh, there was no need for them to go south at all. And so, you know, those, uh, that, those uh, um, investigative researchers that claim that they found Neanderthal bones in the Middle East, well, uh, they should think again. I don't think uh, uh, Neanderthals ever went south. I think they stayed in Europe and uh, above a certain uh, parallel. Uh, certainly uh, around Italy and upwards, okay? That, that's, I think, their range. Another fellow uh, says regarding clothes, uh, remember I'm saying that Neanderthals did not wear clothes at all, uh, any footwear or anything. And this fellow said, instead of searching for a, oh, because I'm saying that the needle uh, is one of the arguments against clothes. We haven't found any needles in uh, Neanderthal sites, and we have over 80 sites in Europe where they found Neanderthal uh, either bones or tools or some, some uh, evidence of presence of the Neanderthals there, and they never found a needle in any of these sites. And you would think that one needle, you know, uh, made of bone, uh, you know, we would have found something like that. They found other things that are made of bone and uh, wood that survived, and we never found a needle out of 80 sites. You know, I mean, you would think that if they all wore clothes, they all had needles, the women, maybe, I don't know, it was a division of labor, and she did, you know, the women did the uh, sewing. Uh, you know, I don't think, uh, it, it, there's no reason for us not to find at least one needle, okay, in all these sites. And so, you know, they found bones, tools, and weapons, but uh, in uh, about 80 Neanderthal sites, but no needle. And needles appear in the record approximately 36,000 years ago. In other words, we're talking about Cro-Magnon, Cro-Magnon. And here I give you a little evidence, okay. This is uh, the first needle we have on record, the Kostenki uh, needle in Russia, and it's dated anywhere between 20 and 36,000 years ago. Okay, and yeah, that first one there uh, does look at, like a needle, okay? That letter A there. Uh, so I would think that is a needle, and that's maybe when they appeared, and I think uh, it may have appeared, again, 30, say 30, maybe I'll take it even up to 40,000 years ago. As soon as man, humans, cro magnons entered Europe, uh, it was cold, and they probably started building clothes. That's when clothes, I believe, were invented for the first time. And okay, that's what it appears to me. There's another argument that it has to do with lice, and you can look that up. That's another argument out there, and that dates close to 175,000 years ago at least. And I disagree with that because um, um, I don't think uh, man in Africa needed clothes. Okay, but they say uh, they uh, the argument is that lice. Uh, went from body lice to hair lice, and that's because they started wearing clothes. Okay, so that's the argument in a nutshell. Okay, anyways, uh, they found a wooden spear 400,000 years ago. That's uh, this little thing here, the Schoeningen spear in Germany, and so it's made out of wood, and yeah, wood does tend to survive sometimes, you know, under certain conditions. If this survived, why didn't the needle survive uh, 40,000 years ago? Okay, so we're talking about 10 times as far back and it's there, and we don't find a needle 40,000 years ago. So again, uh, my, my argument with all this is that, you know, you, you have to look at um, the entire evidence to find out what evidence might fit um, the facts, okay? Of course, we are selective with evidence many times because we want to get our theories through, and one ev piece of evidence maybe uh, negates our theory, and so we kind of sweep it under the rug, so to speak. Uh, you got to be honest with yourself and look at all the evidence. And I try to look at pros and cons of all the arguments as much as possible, as much as I can find. I reach my own conclusions, and all I can do is just share my 10 cents worth with you. My, my idea is that Neanderthals were born in Europe. They had no reason to go south. They wore no clothes. And humans never entered Europe until the Neanderthals were gone, because otherwise the Neanderthals, who were in their own turf, which did not need clothes, uh, they knew their environment, and they probably marked their territories, I don't know, by 
uh, spraying <laughs> urine all over the trees, you know, to ward any enemies, uh, even an, another Neanderthal, because Neanderthals were the worst enemies of Neanderthals. Okay, the only guy who could bring them down was another Neanderthal, just like a lion is the worst enemy of a lion. So I think the Neanderthals were born in Europe. They never left Europe. They had no reason to. Uh, there was enough game there to keep them busy and hung and uh, fed. And only when their population pyramid overturned, that's when they were gone and humans were finally able to enter into Europe and find all these bones, these skeletons, whatever they found there. And they said, okay, uh, someone was here, but he's gone. They probably thought it was another human. Okay, That's the way I, I see that in general terms. Okay, continue with cold. Neanderthals cold. People are wondering about that, right? Uh, Fellow says, you could use the toothpick to poke a bunch of holes in hides and then just weave the string to the holes without even using a tool. Yeah, correctly. But the issue is that that needle, you know, is what we haven't found. Okay, so there's no evidence, at least, of it. I wish there were to show that Neanderthals wore clothes. I don't think we're going to ever find evidence of needles, okay? Because I don't think they ever invented the needle. I don't think they ever did sewing. And you need to sew hides together in order to prepare clothes. You can't just, you know, throw something on top of you, yourself. And I don't think they would have done that anyways. They weren't into that. I, I think they didn't need clothes, okay? So there was no need for them to invent something they didn't need. Uh, any more than a polar bear needs something to cover itself. Okay, then you would hide. Cl uh, you would have hide clothing. You would have hide clothing instead of freezing to death. Yeah, again, see these people think that a Neanderthal would freeze to death. He was there four hundred thousand years or so, maybe less, maybe more, and he never froze to death. Why would he freeze to death? Okay, if he was made for the cold. Does a polar bear fr freeze to death? Does he know what cold means? <laughs> okay, even a dog is smart enough to get under a blanket. Yeah, <laughs> you're, maybe your puppy, you know, at home, the domesticated dog, the one that's already been living thousands of years uh, with man uh, inside a hu house, he's not used to the cold. You can't take your, your dog to the, uh, to the uh, I don't know, to the polar regions, to northern Canada or northern Russia and just let him go there in the freezing snow. He's going he's gonna to die of, of frost. He's going to die of cold. But uh, you, uh, that I know of, no um, polar bear dies of cold. No wolf, no, none of those die, okay, of cold. Another major motivation for inventing clothing is shoes. <laughs> if you don't wear some kind of footwear outside, you'll die a lot faster. Yeah, you will. The question is whether a Neanderthal would. Or at very least, you will, at least you'll be experiencing tons of pain, like walking on hot shards of glass or Legos. Nobody can tolerate that shit for, a long, for long, even if they had Neanderthal feet, especially not females. Poor uh, yeah, they're all females. They had to go in high heel shoes so their feet wouldn't touch the snow. I guess right. Okay, let me wisen this guy up. This this poor fellow here. He's so mistaken. Uh, you know, wolves don't uh, usually wear clothes, but apparently some of them, you know, wear uh, these nightcaps uh, so they don't freeze their ears. Uh, polar bears, you know, they uh, put on gloves even if it's baseball mitts. You know, they don't care as long as they have their hands warm. You know. The uh, mastodons, they, they put on their uh, <laughs> their diapers there so they have their butts uh, warm. And the woolly rhinos, you know, they, they wear socks. Uh, they, they, you know, they, they have to do that because otherwise their feet will get cold. And then you see the penguin and the penguin's feet. Now, the, the feet are directly in contact with the snow. I mean, do, do they wear shoes? So, so the question is, do these animals need clothes? And this fellow seems to think that they do, and maybe he should go out to the North Pole somewhere, you know, or wherever these animals are found, maybe the South Pole, and, uh, you know, uh, put something around them so they won't freeze to death, okay? So, uh, no, uh, I think these fellow, this fellow is, is so mistaken, and so many people believe like he does that, uh, you know, these animals would freeze to death, and they don't understand that they don't. These animals are built for cold, and here's a... Um, Here's a good old Neanderthal, you know, he's got to wear his uh, uh, earmuffs and sandals for otherwise he, he's going to get his feet cold. That's what this fellow believes. Okay? So, yeah, I, I doubt that very much. I don't think uh, Neanderthals had anything to do with the cold. They didn't know what cold was. They never had it in their dictionary. They never said, oh, it's cold today. Never happened. Okay? They were born in the snow. Okay? They lived in caves, you know, uh, they probably... Uh, had fires as well. But when they went out, they didn't dress up and say, oh, it's cold outside. I think I'm, I'm going to dress up. No, no, they just went out like no problem. It wasn't an, an issue with them. They could go out in the cold and they, if, if they used fire, maybe they used it for cooking. You know, we, we don't really know exactly what they did with the fire. I would think they did some cooking. Okay. But other than that, uh, Neanderthals did not need, and they did it also for defense. You know, they, they realized that with fire, they could keep some, uh, you know, some uh, animal like a bear out of the cave. 
So they are understood that they use it as a weapon. Uh, other than that, you know, they could go out there and uh, be in the snow every day. No problem. And you might say, well, is that true? Well, here we have a case in modern day history. Okay, now this is the 19th century, but it's, it's still, you know, 100 years ago. Okay, and it was uh, found by Mr. Darwin and uh, Robert Fitzroy. Okay, and they were the Yagans. Okay, uh, they were also known as the Fueguinos because they're from Tierra del Fuego, south of Argentina and Chile. Okay, and that's in 1883, they were essentially nude. And this is 50 years after um, Darwin saw them. He saw them in 1833, and he uh, put it in his diary. So did Fitzroy. And what they said is that the women, especially, you know, they would dive in the water after their husbands harpooned some fish or some animal from the seas. And they would pull this uh, thing out. The women went, uh, did the diving, and they also dived for uh, seashells, collected seashells. And they were nude in, in the South. And, we're, and, and the uh, British were completely astonished by the resistance that these Yagans had to the cold. And there you see, 1922, they were civilized by them somewhat, and they started wearing clothes. But before then, they were nude. And so uh, look up where Tierra del Fuego is, uh, south of Argentina and Chile, and you tell me if you could live there, uh, nude, okay? If you want to do some, some uh, uh, you know, start your nudist beach over there, you'd starve to death. <laughs> Nobody would, would take off their clothes down there. And the young ones had no problem. They lived like that down there. So, uh, yeah, if uh, humans can do it, and I'm sure the Yagans were not as well protected as the Neanderthals, forget it. The Neanderthals had no problem whatsoever with the cold. They had no idea what cold was. They never had the word in their dictionary. Okay, uh, talking about cold, we have someone talking about the Cold War. I know a little bit about that. <laughs> and it says, uh, looks like the USA lost the Cold War long term. Ha ha ha. Okay. Uh, uh, remember, the Cold War was uh, originally only between the USSR, the Soviet Union, as it became known later, the UFSSR, which means the Union of Fewer and Fewer Socialist Republic, <laughs> uh, UFFSR. Uh, and uh, today, well, yeah, they've uh, stretched their hands across the uh, divide there with China uh, because they have both have a common enemy and the United States is uh, blocking a lot of their stuff. So they decided to form a little bit of a partnership there against the United States. But the way I look at it today, you know, I look at it very differently when I was in my 20s. Uh, there, I used to think of the United States as an enemy. That's how I was raised. That's what I saw around me. But over time, you know, you, you start seeing things a little more clearly. And the way I look at all these is as mafias. They're all mafias, okay? Uh, it doesn't matter if it's the United States, any country in Europe, uh, Russia, China, they're all mafias. They all have politicians who rule and they try to do whatever they can uh, to get their countries rolling or maybe just to uh, get in the, you know, uh, become rich themselves and their friends. And the way I look at it, uh, you know, I don't pay attention to politics anymore. Um, and the reason for that is, you know, if you can't do anything about it, why even get excited about it? So Israel is torturing the Palestinians. So you have war between Pakistan, uh, Pakistanis and Indians. You have uh, fighting, uh, you know, just about everywhere, really, you know, uh, China against Taiwan and so on. There's uh, hot spots all over the world. Any one of them can break you know, the, uh, the peace up there. Am I concerned anymore about all that? Not at all, because again, I can't do anything about it. So why get excited and say, well, this is justice and that's injustice and if I can't do anything about it. So the best way I always recommend to any of you out there, the best way to deal with the world problems to solve them is turn your TV off. You turn it off, you solve the problem for yourself, okay? That's the way you should look at it, okay? So, yeah, I don't uh, worry about the Cold War anymore. Uh, my only concern there is I hope all these countries, the United States, uh, China, and Russia, I hope they keep going upwards and uh, so that we live at least another 50 years if we could do that. You know, so I don't care if, if they torture, if they kill, if they murder. I really don't care as long as I mean, no problem. Uh, my only hope if, if that's what they need to do to get the economy rolling forward, do it. I don't care. I'm not going to even look. I'm not going to question it. Okay. I don't care because my only interest is that the world continue as much as it can. Because again, we're, I'm saying, the last generation of humans on Earth. So I don't care how they do it. I don't care if it's illicit. I don't care if it's immoral, if it's unethical, uh, what, what the governments start doing. I don't care. I really don't. It's not my problem anymore. <laughs> it used to be my problem. I used to lose sleep over it. No more. I just turned the TV off. Okay, uh, another fellow along the same line, more or less, says a system of fiat will always collapse. 
power can corrupt absolute power corrupts absolutely famous saying okay uh well uh, the only thing i got to say about that is that corruption is not what's going to cause the extinction of man i just want to clarify that okay what's going to cause the extinction of man is this the overturning of the uh it's not this is not what's going to cause the extinction of man the overturning of the population pyramid we are overturning that's going to trigger the collapse of the economy and that's what's going to uh, cause the extinction of man. In other words, the, the overturning <clears throat> of the ecological pyramid. We're, we're going to have the many, 8 billion humans, chasing the few, food. There's going to be no food out there. Why? Because we're not going to produce it because the global economy, money is going to be no more. And because money is no more, no one has any incentive to produce it massively for the masses. Okay, uh, Corporations that produce just to distribute, to make money. No money, no incentive, no reason to produce food and no distribution. And so what happens is the ecological pyramid overturns. Why does that depend on the um, population pyramid overturning? Well, because the fewer in part, that's just one of the uh, ingredients, right, in the recipe. And it's, it goes like this, you know, the uh, fewer people we have, the less demand we have. And the less demand we have, the, f uh, the fewer things that big corporations can sell, both goods and services. And if they sell less, uh, well, there's attrition. There's a, an implosion of the economy. Okay, so they lay off workers because uh, they're not producing enough, because they're not selling enough, and that's a cycle that just keeps rolling and rolling until you have a uh, collapse. And I say that that process is going to be exponential, just like it was exponential in the 19th century, going up. You know, when we industrialized, essentially, this is going to be the same thing, but going down, and it's probably going to be steeper. That's my guess on that. Okay. Okay, let's move on here. Uh, so I don't think it's going to be corruption, by the way. It, corruption is, it's just, yeah, it's in, uh, it's in man. Man uh, will try to do the utmost to become rich in general terms. And in order to do so, they don't care how they're going to do it. So corruption is part of the deal. It's part of history. It's been there all, all along, like this fellow says. But it's not corruption that's going to cause the extinction of man. It's going to be the overturning first of the Population pyramid followed by the overturning of the ecological pyramid, food, our food pyramid. Okay, okay another fellow says here, uh, patriar patriarchal groups that live in cities have a high birth rate, which proves this urbanization myth to be false, which is what I'm suggesting. Okay, so I'm saying that all animals don't have patriarchal structures, yet they have offspring. So you got to have a universal, and right now you're only talking about man. You're not talking about all animals. So you got to do a research on all animals, and there you see something, uh, you know, uh, uh, how the fruits um, are attacked by something that's alive, and that living thing grows to a certain point, and then no more. Then it, you know, as their uh, world collapses underneath their feet, so to speak, right? They cannot re continue reproducing and reproducing and reproducing, just expanding. No, they fall together with what's underneath them, what they're relying upon for sustenance. And that means that, you know, that's a, what we call density dependent there, um, density dependent birth rates, okay? Uh, you can't continue expanding forever if what you're relying upon is declining. And that's what he's got to understand as well. All species follow mother nature's law of density dependent birth rates, okay? And here you see the, here's uh, for humans, right? The global history, okay? And here it goes, uh, starts here in a second. It starts with the year, I think, uh, at the beginning of the, uh, the Christian era, yeah, uh, year to zero, then a thousand uh, years. Shows you what's happening with the world. It just continues uh, becoming populated, but see, there are regions that are not populated there, okay? And then in 2050, there will be no humans, okay? I'm saying that we're dead by the, by the year 2050. There may be some human here and there, but it's not going to restart the race again, okay? The, the species. And... Uh, so I moved the other day, I, I, uh, I showed the other day uh, this, which is uh, what the world lo looks like today. And what you see there is all the regions, the, the major regions that have very little population. See, what we're, the way we're set up today, the way we're um, distributed population-wise is in big cities. You have cities like Tokyo, which are, you know, uh, close to 40 million people. I mean, what is it? And I think that's the, with a greater Tokyo. But the point is, People go to the cities today. They, they abandon the countryside and they go to the cities. And so we're not creating new, new towns, new villages. We're not creating new cities. What we're doing is uh, evacuating the countryside, leaving that 
that land to the big corporations, agricultural corporations, and we are moving in what is known as the transition uh, to the cities. So the cities are becoming bigger, and when you have these big ant holes, then density-dependent birth rates take place for cultural, economic, and um, social reasons. Okay, so there's several reasons uh, for why we don't have children in the cities, and it's got nothing to do with patriarchal. Not well, not specifically with patriarchal. It's got to do with density-dependent birth rates. And again, the higher the density, the fewer children you're going to find eventually. And Tokyo is is a prime example. You know. Uh, Japanese don't have children anymore. Neither do Russians. Why? Because Russians have, what, two, three cities, that's it, that's all they have. Mega cities, uh, Moscow, St. Petersburg, you know, uh, Stalingrad, <laughs> as it was called. Uh, that's it. Um, you know, all these, uh, you know, the, United, the Russia does not have uh, many cities. It has a few cities that are big, and everybody's moving to those cities from the regions around there. And so, if anything, we're evacuating the countryside, not building villages and towns in the countryside. It's the other way around. We're evacuating those. Okay, so in fact, a lot of the old people live in um, in towns, and as they die, you know, uh, nobody replaces them because there are no uh, industries going to the little towns. The industries are getting close around the periphery of the big cities, if anything, but never do they go into a little town and say, oh, we're going to install our big company here. No, it doesn't really happen today. Because all these corporations really, what they're doing is moving to the cities where, where the action is and where certain services are available. You can't go to a little town where there are no services or, or it's, uh, many things are missing that a corporation might need. They're not going to go to a little town because if they did, then you know, the young people might flock there and you know, grow with the city, uh, with the town. But that doesn't happen anymore. We're not going to the towns. We're going to the cities. It's the other way around. Okay? Anyways, I encourage people to do... Extinction 101 before they do Extinction 102, meaning you want to do mass extinction first. Very few people tackle mass extinction. They want to do human extinction. They, everybody's an expert at human extinction. I, yet, I have yet to find people who are experts in mass extinctions that occurred already, which is what a theory is supposed to explain. You have to explain how the animals in the past died, disappeared. Okay, And so that's the first one you got to tackle. Then once you become an expert at mass extinction, well, then you can extrapolate those mechanisms, see if humans, you know, can uh, do something about those as well. And uh, the big question I put up out there uh, for anyone who wants to tackle it, and it's related to this again, and it's this, if I can get it up there. Uh, I've lost it. Anyways, uh, it's the question is, why did the animals in the seas die approximately at the same time as the animals on land? Because that's happened in all, essentially, mass extinctions. When the animal on land died, more or less the ones who were flying died, and more or less the ones who were in the waters died almost or approximately at the same time. And you have to ask, why is that the case? Why did these animals die approximately at the same time? Because that might give you a clue as to how Mother Nature does extinction. 